Welcome back to the Backseat Startup Podcast with your host, Andrew Hutton. All right. Welcome back, everyone, to the Backseat Startup Podcast. I'm your host, Andrew, and I'm on with Matt Williamson, founder of Visly, which is a platform tool to power uh, B2B analytics for uh, uh, analytics for modern SaaS companies. I'll let him say that better than I, but, um, but Matt, welcome to the show. Really excited to have you on. No, thank you very much, Andrew. Pleasure to be here as well. Um, yeah, like looking forward to the show. Let's do it. Let's do it. So for everyone who's listening, if you're listening for the first time, we're going to do a couple things. We're going to get to know Matt uh, and what he's building and what Visly is. Really cool story, really cool tool. Uh, love to kind of unpack different styles of startups. And I think what Matt's building is one to pay attention to, right? In, in terms of a lot of the ways that they're building product and going to market and, and being focused. But then we're going to do what we do here, which is we're going to go over to the, the Wild West that is Reddit, find a question from a real live person and answer it and get Matt's take uh, as a founder. Um, you'll hear my take as a founder as well. And we'll try to uh, add some wisdom uh, into the startup world. So with that, without any further ado, Matt, tell us a little bit about Visly. What are you working on? What are you building? What's what's the what here? Sure. So Visly is customer-facing analytics for modern SaaS. Our customers are typically B2B SaaS companies or even marketplaces who need or want to share data with uh, external stakeholders. Uh, so maybe they want to um, build an analytics dashboard for their web application. Um, instead of building that from scratch, they could build it using Visly, connecting with their data, um, designing it so it loops and feels native to their application, and then embedding it inside of their code base. Um, so essentially giving them an analytics capability in the space of hours instead of months, um, or potentially even multiple sprints, I suppose. Perfect. I love it. I love it. I um, There's so many angles to pull on here because, you know, as a concept, the idea of building building blocks for SaaS is a very good idea, right? Like all the people have built, built like payment portals, you're building analytics, and you're doing it in a way, you know, I, I likened you to Stripe, which is a very good example. Maybe <laughs> maybe you'll take it um, in terms of being the tool that powers the, the front end, right? So that it looks seamless. It's it's very developer friendly. Um, it shortens the time and then and then you're plugged in, right? And so, uh, and yeah, let's uh, yeah, let's let's be SaaS or Stripe for analytics. That sounds like yeah, a good uh, end state. I steal that from you. So, so, so tell us a little bit of the origin story, because, because this is a business that you were meant to build, you and your co-founder have worked together. Um, give us a little bit of the version of how this idea came to be and where you saw it and a little bit of how you're fixing it. Sure. So I guess like the, the origin of the, the problem space um, is that I used to look after data products at a company called Skyscanner. Uh, so we built and sold data APIs and SaaS analytics tooling. Um, and I guess like before we had any of that SaaS analytics tooling, we just sold these kind of raw data feeds. Um, and obviously, you know, that's not super accessible for people who can only really consume data or have the ability to consume data uh, only really through a UI. So naturally the next step was for us to build a UI and just really kind of broaden the market. And so, when building this, uh, yeah, our first like SaaS analytics offering with POCs with virtually every embedded analytics solution under the sun. Uh, so like Tableau has an embedded analytics offering, we did a POC with them. Power BI, same thing. Looker, same thing. SciSend, same thing. Good data, same thing. Um, and ultimately came to the conclusion that we were inherently limited um, from a product an engineering perspective, because these solutions are so rigid, just had consequent negative impacts on the quality of end user experience we were able to deliver. Um, these solutions yeah, weren't flexible, they weren't extensible with code, there was only so much we could really do. Um, the embed was an iframe, um, that old school. Um, and so we took the decision to, to build in house using an open source library, I think at the time it was D3. Um, and that is really the kind of like 
I suppose, yeah, like the origin story of, of the problem space that, that we're in. Yeah, addressing. yeah, yeah. I love that. That you 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 were you were actually a layer back. You were working as a data source. You had all this travel data and it was working through the system. You just got to see how clunky it was, how long it took to 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 build these again, something that that hit me as we were chatting earlier, these kind of end user experiences. So so if you just imagine any app, I, I was thinking of the the app we use to send our newsletter, Beehive, has plenty of functionality, but then they have an analytics portion that is something <laughs> and they're a small company growing they're awesome everyone um you should go check out beehive if you're considering a, a newsletter platform but that's where you play is is behind the scenes to get analytics platforms that users yeah. like me would use to look at my sends exactly. and my open rates yeah you know but in a way that's na like not an iframe I, I, theirs isn't an iframe they're obviously past that but but yep. you would power them up in a way that feels native slick Etc. Yeah, right. Exactly. The end user will have no idea. Basically, is even there. That's the idea, right? It should look and feel native to uh, the home application, to our customer, um, and yeah, no one will know. Which is why I liken it to Stripe because because Stripe was developer friendly and it looked and felt native and it scaled hugely and it took them forever to create no code tools for people like me. But you mm -hmm. know, maybe eventually you'll have that. Maybe that won't ever be in your roadmap. Um, that's really interesting. So tell us a little bit more current state or just like the story of the business. You guys, I know a year and a half into this. What's that been like? YC, drop that. Yeah. How's it been since uh, since launching uh, Misly? Yeah. So, you know, like you said, uh, we went full time in, in March slash April 2022, almost a year and a half ago. Um, and then, yeah, accepted into Y Combinator. It was you know, dream come true, um, which is fantastic. We flew out to San Francisco, did it in person. Um, and we did just try to soak up everything, right? Like soak up the office hours, at least those that were in person. Um, some of them are still virtual. Uh, and soak up the time with other founders, other entrepreneurs, and really make the most of that community and, and, and network that we're trying to build and establish for ourselves. Um, and yeah, like, don't get me wrong, it was super intense, like lots of ups and downs, um, by no means a smooth pathway. <laughs> um, but what it taught us was, like, it's just, you know, so damn important to be speaking continuously with prospective customers. Um, and so, um, you know, I have a commercial background. Um, it's not necessarily a kind of a new finding, um, but it really does kind of reaffirm the importance of that. Um, and so we were very, very fortunate, I suppose, to find like a handful of, of design development partners. I know there's a kind of couple of mixed perspectives around like um, our design development partners do mm -hmm. or not. Um, but we were really careful about setting out, you know, our RCP, who it is, who it was, um, before working with these guys. And it was only really because um, I think at that, they were able to kind of like soak up all that feedback and build a product that generalized quite well. And so now, um, we serve over 30 B2B SaaS companies, still, cool. you know, early stage, um, all of various different shapes and sizes, um, typically between C Series A, a couple of them are kind of Series B, um, mainly across, you know, three or four different verticals. But uh, that's where we're at now. Um, and, and yeah, for us, it's still about making a few people really, really happy and, and making sure they love basically inside and out um, before we really kind of take the step um, to the next level. Awesome. I mean, we're getting an early look at, again, <laughs> the Stripe for analytics, the, the um, what will hopefully be a household name, at least in the tech world. Um, <laughs> but yeah, this is, this is really cool to see it early days. Um, I'm sure there's a ton we could go into. But yeah, if you're just an analytics geek, if you're a B2B SaaS product leader, right, all the people who care to like you know, create great user experiences um, through their 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 apps. You should go check out Visly. I'll let I'll let Matt drop his his socials and stuff later. But let's do this, Matt. Let's switch gears to the meat and potatoes of our of our session here. I'm going to uh, jump over, share my screen, go find Reddit. Today's episode of the Backseat Startup Podcast is brought to you by Seed Scout. Seed Scout is a cold outreach alternative that relies 100% on an autonomous double opt-in intro system. Log in, pick a plan, and request intros to investors at ease. 
On SeedScout, know what investors are active, which ones have recently engaged, and send intro requests to ideal investors with a click of a button. Once connected, carry on the conversation over email and feel free to take it off platform. Now, back to the show. And actually, this is, uh, this is, um, this is, this is how the universe works. You know, Reddit could have anything. They happen <laughs> to have a question about your ICP. And I didn't have to scroll too far to find this. Yeah. Um, so we'll stay here because you, uh, literally segued us right to it. I refrained from asking follow-ups because I knew I was going to come to this question. We don't have to literally read this guy's or this person's, um, thought process here, which is, um, which might be interesting and contextual, but how do you determine your ICP? I'm just going to ask it like that because you did that. It was important to you. I mean, I can speak to how important it is and I think let's get into the details yeah. of that balance between having an icp knowing them understand like having the hypothesis this is who we're after like, we think this is true and then validating yeah. it with design partners in a way that you don't get over you don't get taken away on like a you know a rabbit trail because of one person one partner you know where you're starting so you can infuse. anyway that's my take yeah. how did you go about that process and even some of that yc i'm sure that was a crucible yeah how did that happen for you guys yeah like far from linear uh, i guess i'll just start <laughs> from saying that right it's like a certainly didn't just wake up and know the icp um i guess like there is an aspect of you know we were solving a problem at solve our own pain point um so i guess we had a little bit of a head start in that regard but even then you know that actually proved a little bit problematic in some areas, right? Mm. So mm -hmm. uh, what I was building before was, was, was you know, was quite a complex data product. Um, and what we serve now, we, we avoid data products. Um, we build for B2B SaaS companies that maybe don't have an analytics capability um, already, and they're looking to introduce, you know, their first one. And, and, and they're just getting ready to, to build and deliver this, this this dashboard in the context of their application, um, and they they haven't really kind of integrated anything at that, at that point in their life cycle. Um, we went down a rabbit hole of, of, of trying to compete with you know the likes of Power BI and Luca, and you know we, we fundamentally believe that um, basically is a much more solid offering even in its early stage. But these products are hard to rip out; they're really hard to rip out, and so. What we tried to do was, was find something that, you know, was a low hanging fruit, a more kind of urgent problem that we could address now and not later and build around those people um, and just try and find, I suppose, the most kind of like urgent use case uh, that we could satisfy um, and just try to find a bunch of those people and, and, and then see how well we could repeat that. Yeah. Uh, we're still obviously at the point where, you know, not at scale yet we're still in the process of trying to repeat that and again and again and again but um yeah i think it's just like keep talking to people. it's one of the things that you just described that it that you know i think about this most of the time of, of my day actually um and the thing that one of, one of the things that i a framework i have if you will that makes this so complex that you navigate it is the fact that the customer their problem and your solution are all variables that that you know there's many different customer types they have many different problems and then if your solution's not built and it shouldn't be hopefully it's not built hopefully you don't start with the solution hopefully that comes on the other end of talking to these people and figuring this out but then your solutions are variable right and you kind of said all three of those things right figuring out which customer had the most pants on fire problem that then you could solve right yep. And that kind of like flexible, the fact that all of those are moving targets, like I've seen so many folks pick a, you know, so this is theoretically the happy path is you say, I'm going to solve for this customer and hold that as a constant. And then you go down from there and say, what problems do they have? The challenge is the reality is oftentimes it doesn't really pan out. So you have to go look for a new customer, right? Yeah. So I imagine you had versions of that, right? Where you thought it was a customer here, customer A or customer type A, and then yeah. it really is customer type B. And even yeah. just like that construct happens at the high level, but also happens at the details. Cause you know, you mentioned that you found some verticals that are better than others, right? There's in, like, even just like, 
down to the point of like onboarding and sales and everything you're doing at a very tactical level, it matters who you who you target and stuff. Yeah. So like how did you how did you navigate that dance? That's that's exactly. Yeah, it's it's it is really hard. And I think there's there's certain things you'll do with your product that will take time. And those things might, you know, be particularly useful or relevant to a certain audience group. Mm. Um and that's fine, but I think, I think when, when trying to answer this question, I think it's also important to just consider like, what kind of startup is this? Um, so is this a big venture scale startup? You know, does it have the potential for big venture scale? Is there big infrastructure costs, big tech investments that you have mm-hmm. to make to then go mm-hmm. ahead and satisfy what you think is your ICP? Um, or is there like a much more watered down, um, simpler version of that um that doesn't require that 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 crazy crazy venture scale to to try and demonstrate and prove um and you know for us there's like i said earlier right data products that's like a very complex use case for us to go and build for there's so much nuance there to deal with what we can do is deal with the b2b SaaS companies that don't mm. have the capabilities they just want to introduce something you know now um, and then they'll grow and develop into that to be a more complex use case when they go and expand and, and, and I don't know, do whatever they want to do with their products. Um, but yeah, I think the ICP question um, can, can also differ based on like the, company, the type of company you're, you're essentially trying to build. And, and 100%. The way I coach and guide people through that is it's really a constraint, right? If you need to go build a big business, right? Like in venture requires big and requires quickness and like, you know, just the whole, maybe less quick now that we're on the other side of our, the bubble and people are a little more patient, but bigness for sure, which means, um, doesn't just mean a big TAM because most markets are growing and really big these days. Like that's very true. Um, like you couldn't have targeted B2B SaaS 15 years ago because it, it kind of didn't exist, right? SaaS was just burgeoning, right? But we're at the point where you can target B2B SaaS. You can target, um, you can target, you know, creators on the internet that didn't exist for 10 years right so we're there's there's so many more market segments some are very very big some are not so big right and it's actually not always about bigness either it's also about like stickiness right you mentioned you know um i mean i think there's something inherently sticky about what you're doing and the fact that you're just like really deep in with the 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 customer so is, was that a factor in the sense of when you're looking for somebody that like the customer is the one who is going to not just like need the use, like maybe surface level, but like really deeply, like their analytics was not just like a way afterthought or something they're never going to touch again. Like you, you knew you were going to stay with them. Did that come into the thinking? Yeah, like definitely. I think like one of the reasons why um, we like the model that we had is that, you know, we're embedded and integrated into a customer facing context. And so mm. we have a stat that we chuck around sometimes, but anyone um, who's integrated yet, like we're a young company, but so far anyone who's integrated visually is, is yet to churn. Mm-hmm. Um, we've had zero churn. That's um, awesome. That's amazing. Uh, much, 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 much <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so that, that really just makes the, the onboarding process that much more important and making sure that, again, like fine, they, they need to experience time to value. Um, and once they do, they're here for the long haul. Um, but you know, like that, um, that, that onboarding process is, is, is really damn important to us. Yeah. Um, and so I guess like with anything, uh, any startup, you know, I guess one of your kind of competitive advantages is your ability to, to just be really hands-on and to be really caring and to create, you know, I suppose a moat around customer, um, love, uh, customer support. And, and just go above and beyond. Um, there's obviously a time and a point we have to draw the line in the sand and say it's too much. But generally, like we try to really establish really good and firm relationships with, with all of our customers, and we'll try and do that for as long as possible until something breaks. I feel you know it is. A, I think it's a YC line. Do things that don't scale. We all say it, but I think it was a YC line originally, and we all say it. Not everyone does it. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. Right? It's very hard to stay disciplined, right? Into those things that don't scale and usually for far longer than it feels like comfortable to do, right? Um, but there's a lot of counterintuitiveness to business, right? Do things that don't scale, um, get as niche and narrow as you possibly can, right? Don't 
pay attention to those. So it's really rooms. hard. It's really, so the niche hard. narrow thing is, is, is so hard. So we're a horizontal SaaS company, right? So mm-hmm. I talk about ICP and being like, you know, narrow, trying, attempting to be narrow and, and focused on our ICP. Like, like that is by no means um, a finished article. We are still trying to work in that. I think we've struck some luck with with some aspects of, of, of the companies that we've chosen to work with in the early days and how that shaped our product today. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. but I think especially for horizontal SaaS companies, that is a damn hard problem to solve. Um, yeah. And even if you don't build, I think, in that vertical, like we're not going to be you know, customer-facing analytics for B2B SaaS companies and, and HR payroll. You know, we could be that. We have some of those customers. Um, but we can still, you know, build a kind of somewhat generic product, but target and position ourselves in a way whereby, you know, that's the vertical that we go after from a GPM perspective. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, there's an industry vertical that there is, you know, horizontal SaaS means you work across companies by definition means there's a functional kind of focus, right? You, you're not building for customer success per se, right? You're building for product or for end or even a narrower version of that. And, um, and then of course, there's lots of other ways to niche, whether it's company size, it's, you know, funding stage, different things. Right. Um, so you kind of have to pick your, you probably are going to pick across all of those. Those are pretty common factors, right? Maybe there's others that other companies will need, but, but just fundamentally, you're right. It is hard. It is, it is another discipline to stay niche when, when you think you could go for every, you could go for everybody. That's a team. Oh my gosh. You could do it for everybody. Why? But yeah. It's, it's like one of those slowest, the, smooth, smooth is fast. Yeah, yeah right. It's, it's when you get the customer, uh, well, prospective customers coming to you and being like, I want you to build this right now. And maybe the, the kind of um, potential contracts, the numbers on the table are, you know, interesting. Of course, it can be interesting. You're a startup with very little to no revenue. Um, but yeah, just being, I suppose, somewhat disciplined in that regard and making sure that you, you're still, you know, you can still say no. You don't have to take it. Um, and you're still in control for as long as you want to be in control and just being cognizant and mindful that it's okay to say no to those customers that potentially will engage you in big consultancy, professional right. services type right. contracts, right. which will eat away the time to build the thing that, that you're here to build. Um, and we've been offered a few of those um, and then thankfully have said no each time. Um, obviously, the numbers at the point in which they're given to you are, are appetizing. But, <laughs> um, well, if, if, if anyone's facing that, talk to Matt if you need some, um, some accountability to say, to say <laughs> no to money um, it because it's not serving the bigger vision and, and yeah, it's focus, focus, focus. So yeah, I'm glad that our conversation started with ICPs and ended with just focus because that's probably how you find your ICP is to stay focused, to know that you're searching for a narrow definition of who this customer is and and you know we kind of jumped past it but like talking to those customers yes signing them up for design partners learning from them but always staying really cognizant of like how do they fit into that like narrowness right yeah exactly and like just to reaffirm that we are still very much in that process of learning um so yeah we still got like a a, you know a world ahead of us i actually really appreciate you I actually really appreciate you saying that. I think I, I, I think I see it all the time. I, I do see it all the time. Folks are like, "Oh yeah, I'm gonna get product market fit," and they've been working for six months. I'm like, I mean, maybe, but like, no. Let's be serious. Be like, no, impressed. no. It's and it's and it's like it's like a mis. It's like a, it's not a misnomer. It's like a misunderstanding. It's like product market fit. Some one. There was a recent um, Lenny Rachitsky just published this awesome blog post about product market fit or newsletter, I guess, and that like average time to product market fit was like two to three years for like serious successful companies. And like some, there was an outlier that took like five months and like some outliers took like six or seven years, but one years. And two um, it's, it's like this continual thing. And mm-hmm. apparently, and most of the time you don't even, you feel it, but you don't feel it. It just like continues to happen and you're continually fighting for the next rung of it. And it, it is a search for product market fit. This is what we're all on. Right. So it's uh I'm glad you kind of say you're still in the middle of it because that's you know again the discipline is is <laughs> is clear and uh, yeah. it's a really good word for for listeners so Matt this was an amazing conversation again we plumbed the depths of ICPs for much longer Visly is fascinating tell everybody as we wrap up here where they can find you how they can get involved um, or engage with you and uh, and yeah how they can uh, get in sync. 
Sure. So um, you're more than welcome to email me direct to matt.fizzly.co, follow us on LinkedIn, just Fizzly, Twitter, try Fizzly uh, is the handle. Um, we've just launched um, a free tool, Fizzly Lite. Uh, literally anyone can sign up. It's a super kind of watered down version of Fizzly. You upload a CSV, you build a dashboard, you can share it to anyone via URL. Um, that simple. Um, so yeah, more than welcome to get in touch, sign up. Um, and yeah, we're pretty active across social and email. So we'll get back to you as soon as, as, soon as we can. Amazing. Amazing. Super responsive early stage. That's how it goes. Everybody. Thanks so much for listening, Matt. Thanks for being here. And, uh, we'll round it out thanks there. Just the backseat Cheers startup. Andrew. See you next time, everyone. Bye y'all. The backseat startup podcast is brought to you by startup stage, formerly known as startup founder daily. Startup Stage is the place to showcase your startup and compete for features across our channels. Each week, users can vote for their favorite startups. The top three companies, as determined by the votes, are then selected for special features across our blog, podcast, newsletter, and social media platforms. Hit the link in the description below to apply.